Welcome to the final stretch of Modern Horror's Paranormal Activity Retrospective with Paranormal Activity, The Marked Ones. Oh, my shit. Sherlock Holmes. After Paranormal Activity 3 set several new box office records, the series was riding high, so it was decided to begin developing a spin-off movie which would let longtime series writer Chris Landon into the director's seat. And then, Paranormal Activity 4 happened. <laughs> Now, I don't actually know if it was a completely unrelated production hiccup or if PA4's poor reception gave Paramount cold feet, but this was the first activity movie not to hit theaters in October. Instead, its release was pushed out to January 2014 where it soundly failed to continue the series tradition of breaking horror movie opening night records. Despite the underwhelming box office performance, the movie reviewed slightly better than its predecessor, and I do agree with that. For entertainment value, it is a few steps up from PA4, and it probably would have done a lot better if it was released in October when more people are looking for scary movies, because it really did bring some freshness to the series. Now, I think the writers must have felt encumbered by what they thought of as Paranormal Activities style, and being a spin-off freed them up to do something besides the same old haunted house spooks. In fact, The Marked Ones feels more easily recognized as a contemporary found footage movie than as a paranormal activity movie, which just shows how much the genre changed and evolved while its biggest franchise more or less stayed the same. But before we get to the movie, and just to keep the timeline straight, this one is set in 2012, right after PA4 and what is that? Popcorn. Okay, but why is it popcorn? Because this movie is an exciting special effects tour de force. Paranormal activity. Trust me, you'll want this in an hour. Alrighty, now for something completely different. Paranormal activity, the marked ones. Please do not attempt to adjust your set. The director is taking liberties with the Paramount logo to attempt to set tone. We open during a high school graduation speech, but don't pay too much attention to the speaker. Our main character is this guy, Jesse. Also in this shot are his friend Hector, grandmother Irma, father Caesar, and sister Yvette. Later, at his graduation party, he takes a shine to the camcorder wielded by uh, an unnamed family friend and introduces our final two main cast members, his friend Marisol and his dog Chavo. Continuing the series theme of tech nerdery, Jesse has become so enamored with the camera that being without it has left a Canon Vixia-sized hole in his life. Needing to fill that, he buys a camcorder at the local pawn shop using his father's graduation <laughs> gift money. Next on MTV Cribs. That's my mansion right there. Wait a minute, that's not the right show. He's Jesse Arista and this is Jackass. Go. It was nice of the pawn shop guy to throw in a GoPro. While they're nursing Hector's busted knee, they see Oscar again storming out of weird neighbor Anna's apartment. Now, maybe it's just because I just watched Night of the Demons like a dozen times, but uh, doesn't Oscar here look like a Hispanic Edward Furlong? Anyway, a lot of these early scenes are just excuses to, to see or mention Anna, just so you know that she's down there. Like this scene where they're doing shots with Grandma Irma, which is awesome, by the way, and hear shouting from Anna's apartment, so naturally they hook the GoPro up to a TV and drop it down a vent to take a look. But boy, do we get an eyeful. And I... Oh, uh, yeah, Anna is painting a coven symbol onto the stomach of a naked woman. After some stupid pet tricks and some more random jackassery, Hector and Jesse are lighting fireworks off behind their apartment complex. Now, ordinarily, I'd count this as jackassery, but it's actually plot movement because they're interrupted by a panicked Oscar jumping from Anna's apartment. He is, in fact, fleeing the scene of a crime, and then police show up. That evening, suffering from the uh, reefer madness, Hector and Jesse decide to break into Anna's apartment, otherwise known as an active crime scene. 
Now after making sure they've touched everything they can find so their fingerprints are everywhere, including on the collection of VHS tapes stolen in PA2, they find a notebook in a puddle of blood and take it. On their way out, they run into Oscar's gangbanger brothers, so they're at least in good company when the police run all the prints. Looking over the book, they set up Chekhov's unholy doorway of time displacement. You could travel through time. You could only go to unholy places through this door. And find a ritual for summoning a demon, so they decide to uh, go ahead and do that. The ritual involves a black mirror, so they spray paint one, go to a church at night, tape the symbol of the witch's coven onto the floor, chant in Latin over the mirror, and uh, just like that, Bob's your uncle, and a demon shows up to gnaw on Jesse. Look. As part of his new demonic rabies, he now has prophetic dreams and frightened small animals like Chavo. But his friends try to comfort him by maintaining a tradition of juvenile pranks. Skipping past a random jump scare and fart joke, we join Jesse and Hector playing basketball for several hours until it gets dark. Why they're filming it aside, it is nice to see characters in a situation goofing off without anything else in it. We're not going to call back here and see someone spying on them or find the coven symbol on the basketball or anything like that. After that, though, our intrepid duo gets attacked by some gang members while they're trying to grab a snack after the game. Our demon here realizes that Jesse's just gonna curl up and take the beatings, so it needs to protect its investment, and send some gangbangers flying. Whee! Shortly after that, watching the video, Jesse discovers something is protecting him from harm, so naturally he takes advantage of this by performing reckless stunts for YouTube. Though, how did Jesse go from supernatural protection from people beating me up to... I bet it'll catch me if I fall. Feeling invincible, Jesse figures that his invisible benefactor will also tank booze for him and play wingman. So he and Hector crash a gang party where he drinks superhuman amounts of tequila, <laughs> apparently with Wilhelm, still screaming after all these years. His pickup efforts also go well and he and Hector manage to take some girls home to try to score but then they remember that they live with their parents, so naturally, they break into Anna's apartment. Uh, most of the rooms are cleared out by this point, so they've kind of got the run of the place. Uh, Penelope goes with Jesse, while Natalia follows Hector elsewhere. I actually really like this whole bit, mostly because the camera doesn't move. There are a few cuts here and there for time, but otherwise it's a nice and uninterrupted static shot. Just like the uh, tripod shots that I really liked from the first movie. You get to really examine the frame and look for anything that might be happening. Anyway, things start getting hot and heavy with Penelope and Jesse, but even his demonic wingman can't drop her no-glove-no-love policy, so he runs off to find one. While he's gone, she hears a thud near the camera and leans over to provide some light pandering while she investigates it. Okay, that's good, enough fan service. Oscar pops out of the hidden basement and scares her off and then runs away himself, so Jesse returns to an empty room, none the wiser. He grabs the camera and goes looking for her, but runs into Oscar, who is sporting a nice set of demon eyes. He's also got a nice demonic love bite, just like Jesse does, and explains that Anna did something to the two of them, and that they need to kill themselves before they hurt anyone they care about. They're found by Jesse's grandmother, and Oscar hightails it out of there. Jesse tries to chase after him, but he follows through on the whole kill yourself thing, and jumps from the roof of a nearby church. The next day, Jesse and Hector review the tape with Marisol and see the hidden door to the basement, so they decide to go and see what's down there. They find a small table with a bunch of creepy magic stuff and tons of photos of Jesse, Oscar, some of the other kids from the area, and also a photo of Anna and Jesse's mom with Katie's grandmother, Lois, tying Anna into the coven from the first four movies. But this confuses me a little bit, because if Anna is part of the Coven, nothing she's doing matches what we've already established about it. We've been told a few times that the Coven members make deals for wealth and power, but Anna didn't seem very wealthy or powerful. We know the deal is made for the witch's next male descendant, and that the obligation is passed down by a symbolic wedding to a demon. However, Anna seems to be marking children in utero, and no one gains wealth or power. And apparently the mothers of the marked ones all die after birth because Jesse's mom is gone and Oscar is adopted. So I guess that means that there are either two tiers of possessed sons involved here, or the writers just aren't paying attention. But let's see if they clarify this at all later in the movie. Once they get back out, we put a pause on plot advancement to get a nice scene for the trailer, where Jesse tapes himself pulling several unnaturally long hairs from his eyes 
punctuated by a nice jump scare where the lights flash and Jesse's reflection in the mirror changes to look like one of those demonic paintings from a spirit Halloween store. Attempting to figure out what's happening to him leads Jesse to ask Oscar's brother Arturu to let him look around Oscar's old room where they find a closet door covered with newspaper clippings about missing children and murders. Chipper stuff. Marisol finds a clipping detailing the kidnapping of Hunter from the second movie and a note with Ali Bray's number on it. After a minor digression to the grocery store where Jesse goes aggro on some random guy for talking to Marisol, they uh, try to use the Simon game here to ask this thing to leave Jesse alone. Just leave me alone! Now! That night, Jesse thinks he hears Chavo in Anna's apartment and goes into the basement again, only to discover no dog but he does bump into a young Katie and Christy before being bum-rushed by a shadowy figure. The next morning, he's acting really detached and strange, so Hector calls up Ali Ray, who meets them in the park and drops some mythology. Yeah, I'm Hector. Yeah. Summary here is that the coven is called the Midwives, and they use a ritual to mark a child in the womb so that he'll be possessed when he turns 18, and the coven performs a final ritual. Now, it's nice to see the only series survivors so far come back and be taking such a proactive approach to trying to figure out what happened to her and her family, though I do kind of wish they'd expanded her role in this movie beyond this tiny little one-scene cameo. Now, I guess it's possible Christie's wedding to Toby caused her to go into a trance and get this ritual done before Hunter was born, but if the marked sons get automatically possessed when they turn 18, why did the coven bother kidnapping Hunter when he was still an infant? Or again, when he was six? Clearly these possessions are different things, or the writers are just as confused as I am. Anyway, back home, Jesse is giggling while telekinetically torturing Chavo. Man, what does the series have against dogs? After seeing that shit, they head over to the local Cathlamart and get some supplies so Grandma can perform some sort of uh, exorcism cleansing thing on Jesse. Wait, 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 hold on a second, hold on a second. I just noticed this. The store is filled with religious objects, icons, figures, etc. So why does this one shelf of candles have sexy naked ladies on it? All this cool stuff in the store and all she buys are magic eggs? I mean, I get that you're, you're budget conscious, Grams, but this is a freaking demon we're dealing with here. Maybe look into getting a, an installment plan or something so you can bring home some uh, bigger spiritual guns. Anyway, she rubs Jesse down with the plus one eggs of healing, but after a few seconds, he's decided that uh, he's had enough and cracks one of the eggs, which bleeds everywhere. Apparently the egg thing was actually doing something and Jesse goes down while the room starts shaking violently. The lights go out and Hector switches to night vision only to find that Jesse has vanished. But then the corner of the room warps and Jesse pops in. Hey, explosions! Where's that popcorn? Now they try to put us back on edge by dropping a cross off the wall, but after that level of insanity, it's like bringing a knife to a laser cannon fight. Not only can you not compete, but there are laser cannons here. I thought this was a movie about ghosts. Now moving on, Jesse throws his grandma down the stairs because... He's evil now. There's no internal conflict here, just magic powers, he's a dick, egg ceremony, teleportation, and now he's evil. Hector and Marisol are trying to go visit Grandma in the hospital when they're attacked by Jesse. Marisol just whacks him with a baseball bat and he is out of the fight. So now they're taking him to the hospital when somebody T-bones their car and kidnaps Jesse. To get him back and... <laughs> I never thought I'd ever say anything like this, but Hector and Marisol recruit some gang members to go stage an armed assault on the Coven's compound and rescue Jesse. I'll go smoke these bitches. So they grab some guns and head off to Grandma Lois's house. Now to their credit, they do try to be sneaky while they're looking for a way to break in, at least until they find some other woman being held captive at the stables and are bum-rushed by a witch. So Arturo just unloads a shotgun at her point blank. This is great, how is it still warm? Ew. Arturo tries to buy them some more time and stays back to shoot some more witches, and that is hilarious to watch. Unfortunately, he only gets a few more shots off before they overcome him. Hector and Marisol get separated inside the house, and she's thrown down a skylight, leaving Hector alone, armed only with his camera, to diligently film his attempt to escape. 
Unfortunately for him, he is completely surrounded by witches and can't find a way out, so he hides in a closet until the coast seems clear enough to uh, make a break for it. His misfortune continues when Jesse appears and chases him up the stairs where he finds that time travel door that was mentioned earlier. Stepping through it, he finds himself in Mika and Katie's garage on October 8, 2006, the final night of the original Paranormal Activity. I've always wanted to see a movie series retconning itself in real time. Let's go to the split screen replay. After Katie gets out of sight of the first movie, we can see that Hector is already here, but apparently too quiet to be heard on the original footage. Unfortunately, the timing between the two movies is off by like the better part of a minute. Eventually, she starts screaming bloody murder, which is when Mika runs downstairs. Seeing what is sure to be a panicked and sweaty Hispanic teenager with a camcorder standing in the middle of his kitchen, Mika goes on the offensive, which is when Katie capitalizes on the opportunity to swoop in and stab him several times. While she's busy perforating, the guy Hector tries to escape. However, Jesse's followed him back in time and gone into full monster mode, so one set of demonic sound effects that mysteriously only show up in one of the movies later, and Hector is down. There's also a coven member who picks up the camera and stops the recording before the credits roll on the marked ones, well, Jesse and the Witch, great band name, presumably help Katie dispose of Mika's body by hurling it at the camera. I've always thought that the first Paranormal Activity movie was a major factor in kickstarting the popularity of the found footage style after 2006, but it stayed very insulated from everything else that had come out after it, which is a bit of a double-edged sword. As a positive, it managed to avoid a lot of the, the crappier tropes that came out of the genre, but the downside of this was that it failed to evolve. So after four movies of the same sorts of beats and scares, that same day-night cycle, and a string of similar houses, the formula started feeling pretty stagnant. If PA4 represents a failure to evolve, then the marked ones feels almost like an entirely different species. Which I guess it should, because it is supposed to be more of a spin-off than a sequel, so it's different enough that it doesn't feel like a series that's five movies in, but its mythology feels like someone took a look at the synopsis of the other four movies and then invented a coven that kinda sounds like that one. It fits together well enough within its own story, but when you try to make sense of it as part of what the Coven's been doing over the last four movies, it bungles everything up. Specifically, if the Coven is trying to build an army of the possessed, like Oscar's brother says, and they have a reliable source of firstborn sons using this marking ritual that we see Anna using, why on earth would they bother with the more complicated deals like what they've been doing with Katie and Christie's family, where they need to apparently abduct the same kid multiple times. That's not to say that it's not entertaining. It's got decent characters and feels related enough to paranormal activity that the references don't feel artificially grafted on. It's even got some tension and uh, appropriately startling moments. Now, unfortunately, as a more contemporary found footage movie, it's brought some of the cheaper tropes in with it, namely that it's gone completely off the rails and beyond even dramatic recreations of ghostly activity, and that Hector goes into Jesse's rescue armed only with a camcorder, that he steadfastly holds at perfect eye level, always facing the most interesting thing in the room. What this leads to is a removal of the tense threat of being trapped in your home with something unseen, and replaces it with spectacle, which is fun to watch, but just doesn't last. Next time we'll see how they tie it all together in Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension, the sixth and final movie in the Paranormal Activity series. But until then, I hope you've been enjoying this Paranormal Activity retrospective. Feel free to discuss this in the comments below, and if you have anything else that you'd like to see on the show, you can also leave that below. Anyway, please consider subscribing or following us on Twitter or Facebook to be notified of future videos. Cheers, and if I don't see you, happy holidays. Oh, no.